Catholic Martyrs of the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, A Catholic Holocaust, by Fray Justo Perez de Urbel. Chapter 13, Two Sisters. We have mentioned the Santina before. She is the virgin of Covadonga, the beloved patroness of Asturias. Now we will trace the suffering of two Asturian girls following in her footsteps. Information about the families of the heroes and martyrs have, in our opinion, great importance. Firstly, the hero and martyr appear in their natural habitat, against the background that formed their spiritual life, their ideas, their feelings, and the conduct of their lives. One can better appreciate the sacrifice of those who put love of the family above all other human and earthly interests, but nevertheless, sacrificed the love of wives and children for the conservation of the faith and the salvation of the motherland. Finally, these family scenes give us an idea of the exemplary moral fiber of the Spanish Christian family. In all the cases described, the education of the children is the traditional Christian hearth education. The father and mother, with their authority, Sacrifices, work, love, and sincere piety form the character and the heart of the children in the love of God, with the principles of the Bible and of the Church, and with love for Spain. This spirit of the Spanish family is founded in the nature of each individual and in the nation, but nurtured by supernatural grace that sustains the mothers and fathers, the wives and husbands, the sons and daughters. All united by persecution, this spirit is what inspired the heroes in their struggle for freedom and justice, and it is what held the martyrs firm to the moment of death. That is why the reader has noticed that our descriptions of the martyrs go back into their family tree, since it is there that you find the foundations and the influences that created the martyr. The life of an individual, and even less his death, cannot be considered in isolation. Isolated, it loses conviction. When death is bound up with the whole life, it becomes significant and edifying. There were two sisters, the only offsprings of a very Christian family in Gijón. Marxism was especially violent in Asturias. They were twins, 23 years old, Pilar and Amparo Evias. They were the heart and soul of Catholic action in Gijón, and their example brought many girls into the church. Of modest demeanor, these prudent maidens were the joy of their elderly father. Their mother was dead, and he gave continual thanks to God for his daughter's noble vocations. They were, in fact, the logical outcome of their family background. Before she died, their mother instructed them always to love God above all things, the only way to ensure they would all be reunited again in heaven. The pen wavers here. In these chapters of inhuman violence and the violation of every human and divine authority, it is impossible to ignore the diabolical violations of honest, pious women who preferred death to sin and who died at the hands of those bestial assassins. What a martyrdom, that of the mothers and wives, daughters and sisters, during so many months of terrorism. But, even if the pen trembles, we must forge on. The anarchy and terror found Pilar and Amparo at the height of their zeal, their duties, and their virtue. In Gijón, as in the other towns dominated by the rabble, the Marxist left-wing propaganda cited the rights of man lauded the happy state of a society based on liberty, equality, and fraternity. This claim rang false and untrue, though, in the mouth of those leaders who established the reign of terror in place of liberty, cruel persecution in place of equality, and criminal assassination in place of fraternity. Their actions speak louder than their words. When they had all the reins of power in their hands, they used them with cruelty and inhumanity, not for good but for evil, to profane, torture, assassinate. 
The man who feels more like a wolf than a man in the presence of another man when he divests himself of his humanity and ceases to be a rational being, he takes on the mantle of the cruelty and ferocity of a beast. The militia of Hihon were these terrible wolves. This is one of the least known chapters of the national martyrology, reported by someone from whom old age had rubbed out all memory of facts, dates, and details. But its terrifying primitiveness stays with us. A few days after the establishment of red power in the Asturian capital, some militia, armed as always, went in search for the father and two girls. The conversation went thus. Are you Don Serafino Evias? Yes, sir. Come with us. Where are you taking me? To work in the docks as a docker? I won't be able to stand it. I am too old. Well, if you can't stand it, bad luck. And he went to the docks. You can imagine the sort of people he had to mix with from now on. He was a target of savage hatred even more savage because there was no human reason to justify the animosity toward an old man who had been completely unknown up to then. He suffered ill treatment, ridicule, and blows. His daughters were distraught. Since they were also under threat, they did not dare leave the house. They couldn't even go out to get food. One day, however, they decided to risk it. They could not endure the gossip about what had happened to their old father. On the day he was taken away, they heard that he was being taken to work at the docks, and so Pilar and Amparo decided to go to the docks. They managed to find their father. His appearance and general state were dreadful. Burdened by the fatigue of work far greater than his strength, his eyes, his hands, and his whole body showed the slow martyrdom to which he was being subjected. They managed to talk to him. Think about it. An old man and his two daughters meet each other in totally abnormal circumstances. What may happen in the next hour or even the next minute is completely unknown to them. The omens were unfavorable. In fact, one must wonder what horror might follow if his present torture only continues. The scenario is far from hopeful. Don't come here again. I forbid it. There are dreadful people around here. We will come, and God willing, nothing will happen. We can bring you food and clothes. Don't come, said the old man for the last time. Then, to avoid suspicion aroused by his long visit and conversation, they separated. Once back home, Pilar and Amparo burst into tears of grief. Women well trained in fortitude, they had contained their horror while in the presence of their father. But now that there was no risk of their own grief augmenting that of an old man, they could let themselves go. It was a dreadful situation there at the unfriendly docks. One day, any day, possibly quite soon, their father could collapse exhausted, and he would be left to die there under the sun, alone, with no one to help him. The day that the two girls had foreseen did, in fact, materialize. They went to the docks with their usual daily package of food, but their father did not turn up at the usual meeting place. They thought perhaps he was just late. Nevertheless, shortly afterwards, they noticed that the militia who guarded the prisoners were roaming about watching a group that was resting. This frightened them very much. Without thinking, they went up to one of the militia and asked about their father. The militia passed them to another one, who said he fell into the sea that morning and drowned. He didn't know any more. Exactly what did happen to him will never be known. The two sisters were on their own. Undisciplined bands of militia wandered all over the city, a law unto themselves, spreading death on all sides, brimming with hatred, always drunk. The scene turns more somber day by day, gloomier, and at last, disaster. It happened like this. A slatternly neighbor of the sisters denounced them. Early the next day, the militia came for them. They broke down the door with their rifle butts and came into the house shouting. Pilar and Amparo were in bed. 
they dressed quickly and went out to confront the intruders. Without any explanation, they were taken away simply because that was what was required, without any concern for their rights. They were taken to the committee, where they had to endure obscene conversations that terrified them. We don't have to go into details. The reader can work it out. Two Christian maidens in the midst of an atheistic mob, satiated with wine, out of control, comprised of the lowliest strata of society. The reader can imagine the rest. At midday, they were forced to sweep and wash the floors of a cheka to which they had been transferred. A militia woman followed them with a stick, and if they showed any sign of fatigue, beat them furiously. He kept up a running discourse on the horrors awaiting them. After two hours of very hard work, they had finished the washing, and the woman guarding them said, Right, as you have behaved well, I will give you some food. In fact, she took them to a nearby tavern that sold food, and in front of the two exhausted girls, the woman had something to eat herself, but gave them nothing. Soon afterward, a couple of militia came in. They made some unpleasant suggestions. They resorted to brute force accompanied by the diabolical cackling of the woman. Since the sisters defended themselves with vigor and energy, they were tied down, one after the other, and after their mouths had been forced open, an enormous quantity of wine was poured into them, enough to knock out a man, let alone refined ladies, unaccustomed to drink. After a quarter of an hour, they had lost consciousness and the militia carried out their fiendish purpose. This happened in Spain, in Spain in the 20th century, and not between different races, but between Spaniards, between Spaniards. The persecutors and the persecuted were all Spaniards. This must not happen again. We repeat, it must not happen again. Some days later, Pilar and Amparo were found dead on the beach of San Lorenzo, each with a bullet in the chest.